Worldlink TV presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Peace be upon you, this is the News in Brief. Sharon says that Israel is willing to accept the roadmap, which will be voted on by his cabinet in two days. The U.S. Secretary of State said during the Group of Eight Foreign Ministers meeting in Paris that Washington is committed to addressing Israel's concern over the roadmap. However, it does not mean that they will add amendments to it. El Qassem Brigade claims responsibility for an explosion near an Israeli pass on the Mintar Netzarim Road, wounding nine people. The Lebanese Hezbollah denies any ties to the fishing boat stopped by Israel. The boat was carrying weapons and was on its way to Gaza, coming from Lebanon. Meanwhile, the Palestinian Authority denies Israel's claims, saying it is a new destructive plan to avoid implementing the roadmap. The U.S. Administrator in Iraq, Paul Bremer, announces the dismantling of the Iraqi Armed Forces, other security agencies, and the ministries of defense and information, adding that the coalition forces are planning to organize a new Iraqi army. 1,467 people have been killed, and more than 7,000 were wounded in the most recent numbers of the earthquake victims in Algiers and its surrounding areas. It is expected that the numbers may increase, since hundreds of people are still buried under the rubble. This is the end of the News in Brief. Peace be upon you and welcome to the news. The U.S. President said that he may meet with both the Palestinian and Israeli Prime Ministers soon. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon stated that Israel is ready to accept the roadmap for peace in the Middle East. He said, however, the cabinet must be the one to make the decision, and it will be voted on in two days. Today, the U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, announced that his country does not intend to amend the roadmap, and Washington declared that it understands Israel's concern over the roadmap. Israel's Prime Minister Ariel Sharon announced that he is ready to accept the roadmap. However, the decision has to be approved in the upcoming session of the Israeli cabinet. His statements came after the United States made a commitment to revise the roadmap. This announcement was preceded by a number of meetings between Sharon's chief of staff and the U.S. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. However, the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell stated that Washington's commitment does not mean that they need to amend the road map, adding that they will address the Israeli concerns while implementing the road map. We have told the Israeli government that we will take their comments into consideration. We will deal with these issues fully and seriously as we move forward in the implementation of the roadmap. This does not require us to change the doctrine of the roadmap. Meanwhile, the Israeli government is seeking American assurances regarding the roadmap, refusing to go forward without them, adding that the U.S. President George Bush may meet with Palestinian Prime Minister Minister Mahmoud Abbas and his Israeli counterpart Ariel Sharon in Cairo. The Palestinian Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas objects to any amendments to the roadmap, noting that any change will completely obliterate the peace plan. Nevertheless, the American administration demanded the Palestinian government improve their security measures. In that frame of work, Mahmoud Abbas met with the Hamas leaders in Gaza asking them to stop the militarization of the Intifada in an effort to achieve peace in the Middle East. The U.S. Central Command urged the top officials in the Iraqi Ba'ath Party to immediately surrender to the coalition forces in light of the orders given by General Tommy Franks. Meanwhile, many Iraqi political parties objected to Paul Bremer's postponement of the Iraqi National Conference, scheduled at the end of this month. It has been rescheduled for July.
بينما كان العراقيون ينتظرون بفارغ الصبر نهاية هذا الشهر لإعلان عقد The Iraqis are anxiously awaiting the national conference to be held at the end of this month. This conference was to discuss the composition of the Iraqi interim government. However, U.S. Administrator Paul Bremer's announcement of postponing the conference till July put down all hopes. The different Iraqi political parties continued to meet in an effort to present a joint plan for the future government of Iraq without being transformed into an executive authority as the Americans want. Unfortunately, this only serves American and British plans for Iraq. It is in contrast with the national Iraqi political position. The Socialist Party under the Savoya leadership also claimed the same position, demanding that the immediate creation of the coalition government with a wide-scale base, asserting an independent Iraqi decision. We believe that this government will be key to Iraq's independence. It will also deal with the security, social and administrative problems facing Iraq. In light of the current opposition to the American plans, some political parties welcome the idea of an Iraqi national executive authority, explaining that an interim government will be unable to rule the country with a damaged infrastructure and the lack of security. The general opinion is to form a national executive authority, to be responsible for fulfilling all demands within a certain time frame and in collaboration with the coalition forces in Iraq. Bremer's postponement of the national conference to mid-July raised a wave of anger among the political parties in Iraq. However, other parties welcomed the American plan to form an executive authority. Adnan Aboud, Abu Dhabi TV, Baghdad. Iraqi residents in Lebanon are happy to return to their country. More than 700 Iraqis have been worried about the future of their country. Their happiness is being renewed as Iraqis prepare to leave Beirut to return home. Amid these celebrations, more than 700 Iraqis gathered their suitcases for the group trip, returning from their motherland after many years away from home. I say thank God, I'm so happy right now. I thank God for the day we finished with the dictator and we are able to return to our country. Thank God. I hope all of the Iraqi brothers in the rest of this country return to their nation to help rebuild it. The trip to return home is being administered in cooperation with Iraqi institutions and the governments of Syria and Lebanon, since it is now difficult to cross through the Syrian-Iraqi borders. However, the government order that permitted this group's return was given by a predetermined list of three. It's a good feeling for someone to return to his country after a long time of being away. We did not come by choice to earn a living or to spend time with family. You see, all these people, they want to return to their country, but because of the Syrian road is closed, we are forced to leave in this convoy. 508 Iraqi men, women and children gathered here at this field in southern Beirut. Standing with them are 160 people who were previously detained for attempting to enter from the places other than the eastern border. The group expressed their joy over the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime and their ability to return to their family and land after years of separation and hardship. The feeling of the Iraqi returning to his land is the feeling of every citizen who returns to his country. It is a natural feeling that a person, after his departure and separation from his land, will be happy to return to his country after a long period of time. 
Of course, I'm happy to return to my country. But first, I want to thank the government of Lebanon because they welcomed us and allowed most of the Iraqi exiles to live in their country. May God protect your country. God willing. I lived in Saida. I thank the people of Saida and the Lebanese people who protected us, helped us a lot, and didn't bother us. Lebanon is like my own country. This is an indication that this voluntary return by the Iraqis will be repeated in similar areas to transfer more Iraqi residents in Lebanon to their country. Australian Foreign Minister Alexander Downer has arrived in Baghdad for a 24-hour visit as part of a five-day tour of the region. Downer will meet Australian forces and representatives of the U.S. administration there. Australia was the third largest contributor of military forces in the war. He called on the United States to take its time getting up the government and not ma make ma any mistakes and praised the United Nations Security Council for Thursday's lifting of sanctions. The main arguments behind the Bush administration's call for war against Iraq were the claims that Iraq possesses alleged weapons of mass destruction and has relations with so-called terrorist networks. So far, neither one of these claims have been confirmed, and the Bush administration is facing increasing questions about the information used to justify the invasion amid accusations from senators against the U.S. president of manipulating the September 11 events to switch public focus from bin Laden to Saddam Hussein. Since the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in mid-March, search teams have found no strong evidence that directly supports U.S. claims that Saddam Hussein was harboring alleged weapons of mass destruction. Those claims that Iraq had an active, widespread program to develop such weapons and that it had ties to so-called terrorists, particularly those in Al-Qaeda, were the main arguments behind the Bush administration's urgent call for an action of war against Iraq. According to a report in Thursday's New York Times, the CIA has begun a high-level review to determine whether the American intelligence community erred in its pre-war assessments of Saddam Hussein's government and Iraq's alleged weapons program. A senior intelligence official said the review was planned since before the war and was designed to look at where the intelligence community succeeded and where it did not. But other officials told the Times the intelligence on Iraq was politicized and when U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld did not get reports from the CIA that supported his beliefs about Iraq, he created a special Pentagon unit to review intelligence reports. So they were out to transform not just the Department of Defense, but the intelligence bureaus as well. And they pushed and pulled and dragged out of them every bit of evidence that they could that supported their pre-existing agenda. That's what they got. They succeeded internally, but now the chickens are coming home to roost. On the Senate floor on Wednesday, West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd said the Bush administration lured the American people into launching what he calls an illegal unprovoked attack on another nation in violation of international law. Byrd says the administration manipulated the events of 9-11 to switch public focus from Osama bin Laden to Saddam Hussein. The White House insists the alleged weapons of mass destruction will turn up eventually, but Joe Sirincion of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace said it's becoming increasingly obvious that the alleged banned weapons program did not exist, at least on the scale that the administration claimed, because he added, if it did, we would have seen it by now. Even now, it's becoming painfully obvious that the weapons of mass destruction programs did not exist at the levels that our intelligence uh, uh, assessments said they did. There clearly were not hundreds of tons of chemical or biological weapons, dozens of Scud missiles, a vast program underway. We couldn't, they could not hide or, or destroy or move um, equipment and, uh, and weapons of that magnitude. We would have seen it. It is now clear more than ever that the issue of the banned weapons was a pretext the George Bush administration used to occupy this Arab country for purely colonial reasons. 
and the U.S. adventure in Iraq has opened the door to a dangerous precedent in the present world system that was supposed to be based on the respect of the sovereignty of nations. Israel said Thursday it had intercepted a boat heading from Lebanon to the Gaza Strip, smuggling weapons materials. An Israeli TV station claimed that the boat took off from Alexandria Harbor in Egypt to Morsi Matruh, and from there it headed to Lebanon, where a Hezbollah member got on the boat. But a a second Israeli version identified the man as an Egyptian national named Hamid Muslim Abu Amara, who, is allegedly, who allegedly works with Hezbollah and lives in Lebanon. Israeli military sources claimed that two members of Hezbollah were detained on board the seven-meter-long ship. The sources added the ship was intercepted on its way to Gaza by the Israeli Air Force. The ship was 150 kilometers inside the sea that is on the international waters. Hezbollah issued a statement in Beirut route saying it had no knowledge of the ship and denied that and said no Hezbollah members had been arrested in recent days. The Washington Post newspaper said Friday, quoting U.S. officials, that the White House planned to issue a statement Friday saying it recognizes Israel's concerns on the so-called roadmap to peace and would seek to address them, with Washington concerned that Israel's refusal of the plan might become an impediment for its part. Israel on Friday implicitly linked a possible Middle East summit between U.S. President George W. Bush and the Israeli and Palestinian prime ministers to U.S. guarantees which would take into account Israel's remarks on the roadmap. In another context, Palestinian Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas met with Hamas leaders to discuss a halt to resistance operations. Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh said Hamas clings onto resistance, but the two sides vow to continue talks. Two thorny issues were discussed in meetings held over the past days. The roadmap to the so-called peace between Palestinians and Israelis and halting Palestinian resistance operations. A meeting on Tuesday between White House officials and the Israeli chief of staff of Premier Ariel Sharon, Dov Weisglas, reached a tentative agreement on the roadmap. The New York Times described the endorsement as some artful language that would allow Sharon to endorse the plan, but somewhat ambiguously. A diplomat said the idea is that Israel accepts the principles the framework and the process of the roadmap and the two-state solution, but yet it would not accept every detail. The roadmap had stated that Palestinian security forces would rein in fighters while Israel withdraw from Palestinian towns and freeze construction in Jewish settlements. Sharon, however, expressed major reservations at a time when the Palestinians accepted the plan. According to an official familiar with waste glass meetings, there was an understanding reached that would allow Israel to accept the roadmap and allows the Americans to move forward. The language of the endorsement would guarantee in a general way that Israel's concerns would be addressed, a U.S. official said. Israel wants a ban on the return of Palestinian refugees to their land and the postponement of the issue of dismantling Jewish settlements to the distant future. But a senior Israeli official said without an American letter of guarantee, it would be impossible to get the Israeli government and public opinion to accept the roadmap. The Washington Post said Friday, quoting U.S. officials, that the White House planned to issue a statement Friday saying it recognizes Israel's concerns and would seek to address them with Washington concerned that Israel's refusal of the plan might become an impediment. It added that Sharon is expected to present the roadmap to the Israeli cabinet on Sunday for a possible vote. The newspaper reports follow U.S. officials' announcement Thursday that U.S. President George W. Bush was weighing a possible Middle East summit in Egypt or Geneva with Sharon and Palestinian Premier Mahmoud Abbas after he attends the group of eight industrialized nations meeting from the 1st of June to the 3rd of June in France. But Israel implicitly linked this summit to a U.S. letter of guarantee over Israel's remarks on the roadmap. U.S. officials told the New York Times Bush on Wednesday had met briefly and secretly with Palestinian Finance Minister Salam Fayyad. Israel, among other things, wants a crackdown on Palestinian fighters, a move that Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen, pledged to conduct. A 90-minute meeting was held on Thursday between Abbas and Hamas leaders at the Premier's office in Gaza City to seek a halt to operations against the occupation. Hamas said it would not consider halting attacks on Israeli settlers and soldiers in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but expressed its readiness to halt operations in the Israeli-occupied territories since 1948 if Israel takes the first move.
For our part, we stress our refusal to the roadmap and stressed on the right of the Palestinian people to resist the occupation. We also displayed our same position which we stated in Cairo, that if the Zionist enemy stopped killing Palestinian civilians, release all the detainees and hold the assassination policy, then the movement might stop targeting the so-called Israeli civilians. Hamas leaders who stood firm on the group's position to continue operations as long as the occupation exists seemed at ease after the two sides ended the meeting. The Prime Minister has informed Hamas leaders of the latest political developments and the policies concerning the internal situation and reforming it. During Tuesday's meeting between the Premier and Hamas, there was a serious discussion and I think it was fruitful. There was an agreement that this dialogue would continue and we hope we could reach to Palestinian-Palestinian agreements in the near future. Though that no specific results were concluded except for agreeing to meet again, other controversial issues remain subject to discussions, mainly that Hamas would re-evaluate its stances based on international positions. French Foreign Minister Dominique de Villepin said on Friday he would meet Palestinian President Yasser Arafat during a trip to the Middle East on Sunday and Monday and Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon if possible. De Villepin said that it is now time to push for real progress on the roadmap for peace in the Middle East and that he planned to meet Israeli Foreign Minister Sylvain Shalom, Arafat and new Palestinian Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas. Regarding the plans to meet Arafat, something the U.S. says it no longer wishes to do, Villepin said in English, quote, it is our policy, it is French policy, it is our position, the European position on this matter to meet and speak with everybody, unquote. Palestinian resistance group Hamas attacked an Israeli bus with explosives on Friday in the Gaza Strip. Friday's bus attack, the fifth Hamas bombing in a week, injured two, pe two people. The bus was en route from the Jewish settlement of Nizarim in central Gaza to Israel. Fifteen people were on board when the explosion occurred. Hamas claimed responsibility during a rally in the Gaza refugee camp of Jabalia, saying it had targeted the bus with a pipe bomb. The Israeli military said the explosion came from a roadside bomb. According to residents, following the attack, Israeli army tanks fired shells near neighboring Palestinian areas and occupation soldiers began searching farms. On Thursday, Palestinian Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas asked Hamas to halt attacks against Israelis. Hamas told Abbas it would consider stopping attacks on civilians in Israel, but would continue targeting illegal Israeli settlers and occupation soldiers in the West Bank and Gaza. further amendments to the Middle East roadmap for peace. A firm confirmation made by U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell following a misunderstanding of a White House statement that the U.S. was considering changes to the peace plan to address Israel's reservations. We're not planning on making any changes to the roadmap. I might mention that just uh, a few moments ago in Washington, uh, the United States issued a statement. And in that statement, we took note of the fact that Israel has made certain comments with respect to the roadmap, and we had asked the parties to let us know if they had comments concerning the roadmap, and we have told the Israeli government that we would take their comments into consideration and address them fully and seriously as we went forward in the implementation of the roadmap, but this does not require us to change the roadmap. It is a good document that leads to the president's uh, vision of two states living in peace side by side, the vision that I think all of us here hold. Following the U.S. statement, Israel accepted the roadmap and Prime Minister Ariel Sharon said it would be presented to the cabinet for approval when they meet on Sunday. Israel said you had pledges uh, to address security concerns was the reason behind the change of heart. 
United States uh, promises, pledges uh, to address uh, seriously and fully uh, those concerns as we move, move along uh, the stages of implementing uh, the roadmap to peace. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, these concerns are, are very important for us, but they in no way uh, are an impediment to start the process, because right now, the main stage that we have to accomplish is first of all to bring about a cessation of violence, of terrorism and incitement. And until a major effort is expanded by both sides to do just that, we can't even start on the roadmap to peace. So actually accepting the roadmap, that's something that is very important, yes, as a declaration uh, of intent. But in practice, what is more important is performance right now. The announcement broke a deadlock in efforts to end over two years of bloodshed and the absence of any political contact between Palestinians and Israelis. The roadmap proposed by the U.S. and endorsed by international mediators details steps taken by both sides to resume negotiations ending with the establishment of a Palestinian state by 2005. The plan demands Palestinians to crack down on militants and Israel to halt settlement activities on occupied Palestinian land. The Palestinians who have immediately accepted the peace plan welcomed Israel's decision as a step in the right direction. U.S. President George W. Bush also welcomed Sharon's decision and said a meeting with both leaders was possible. I'm exploring the opportunities as to whether or not I should meet with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abu Mazen as well as uh, Prime Minister Sharon. If a meeting uh, advances progress toward two states living side by side in peace, I will, I will strongly consider such a meeting. Israelis, Israelis also piled pressure on their government to accept the roadmap and stop settlement activities. Peace demonstrators gathered at a Jewish settlement near the West Bank city of Ramallah, calling on their government to dismantle such settlements. Holding banners and chanting the Peace Now movement demanded that the government move forward with the roadmap and demolish the illegal outposts as the first step towards peace. Over the years, the Israeli government continued to build Jewish settlements in the West Bank, despite calls by the international community for a halt. The very first thing that Israel is supposed to do is to take down these unauthorized outposts, which are in fact new settlements, and to freeze building in the settlements. We're calling for implementation of the roadmap and to start by taking down these outposts. In earthquake hit Algeria, hopes of finding survivors faded as the death toll topped 1,600 despite frantic efforts by teams of foreign rescue workers and sniffer dogs. The Algerian government declared a three-day mourning period for those killed in the quake. Meanwhile, foreign uh, aid has started to arrive in Algiers. A Jordanian aid cargo donated by the Hashemite Charity Committee will leave tomorrow. Here's more on rescue efforts in this Reuters report. 39 hours after Algeria's worst earthquake in more than 20 years, and a two-year-old girl is pulled from the rubble of what was a five-story building. Special rescue crews from Europe were called in to help recover survivors after the quake, which measured 6.7 on the Richter scale on Wednesday night. It flattened whole apartment buildings and shook the foundations of many. Up to 1,500 people were killed and nearly 7,000 injured. Rescuers immediately scrambled to save people trapped under the debris with efforts intensifying. Specialist teams from countries across Europe have been working in one of the hardest hit places 30 kilometers east of the capital, Algiers. Dozens of military planes flew in, loaded with rescue teams and medical and humanitarian aid. Specially trained sniffer dogs were also brought in to help with the search for survivors trapped under the rubble. While rescue efforts continue around the clock, food and water are running low for the tens of thousands left homeless and out in the open, prompting fears the human toll from this disaster could grow. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, 